welcome to another one of these virtual learning lessons at the uh, Behavior Genetics Workshop. Uh, let's see, I want to start off with a little bit of an introduction to myself. Um, my name is Michael Hunter. I'm a professor at Georgia Tech uh, in quantitative psychology for a number of years. And you're going to be hearing today from me about multivariate models. Uh, I'm going to start introducing the topic today. Uh, before I get into that, I like to start a lot of these either with a joke uh, or with uh, some dog pictures, so uh, we can start off with the dogs. These are my dogs, Jamie on the left and Lily on the right. And a question we might want to know about them is, are they genetically related or is it uh, just happenstance that they look uh, similar? And then we can start asking questions about their various traits of uh, size, color coding, and things like that and want to know about uh, the genetic origins of those, and we may want to correlate them, or we could just look at cute dog pictures. Uh, either one is fine. So on to the main topic of today. Get this going. Should be able to see this screen, be able to see me and this presentation. Uh, so this is uh, titled sort of From Ace to Mace, the Multivariate ACE Model, uh, Genetic Correlation and Multivariate Models, uh, one of three that I have planned so far. Uh, so a plan of what we're going to do today, I'm uh, going to talk about the conventional uh, version of describing the ACE model, uh, which is sort of as a, a factor model. Uh, then we're going to talk about a different way of describing this model as more of a variance component model. Uh, and that variance component model will help us do two things. So one thing it'll help us do is extend this to multivariate outcomes. Uh, and the second thing it'll help us do is relate these ACE models that are more conventionally associated with twin and family designs to uh, ACE models that you might make for uh, people that are classically or nominally unrelated individuals, where you have, say, measured genomes uh, with kind of genome assays. So then we're going to kind of build up uh, from that univariate variance component model into two phenotypes, three phenotypes. Uh, and so on. When you have two phenotypes, there's uh, an important topic that kind of arises from this uh, called genetic correlation. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, sort of introduce you to the topic. And then this last bullet point is sort of uh, um, going in depth on modeling some of these genetic correlation matrices. So in the kind of brief version of this, if you have two or more phenotypes, uh, then you can have uh, genetic relationships between those uh, phenotypes so that the genes that explain one phenotype might be the same uh, as the genes that explain things in another phenotype. There's sort of shared genetics between them. You could also have shared environments uh, in a couple of different ways. And then essentially you've got, uh, if you've got more than two uh, of these phenotypes, you can have a whole correlation matrix and then you start modeling that correlation matrix the same way you would uh, in other kinds of methods like structural equation modeling, which we'll talk about. Uh, but before we get into that, we need to start with the basics. So here's some information on just ACE model, classic presentation uh, in twin family designs. Uh, typically, we use monozygotic and dizygotic twin pairs. We decompose between person uh, phenotypic variation into three components. You can identify other kinds of components with other kinds of designs, but these are sort of the, the foundational ones that we usually think of and build off of. So the A component is additive genetics, the C component is common or shared environments, uh, things uh, that you get that are the same between siblings raised in the same household. Uh, and then you get unique or unshared environments, which would be things that are different across siblings uh, shared in the same household. Um, the typical presentation of this is sort of set up uh, in a diagram as a confirmatory factor model with a known number of factors, uh, known factor covariances, uh, and a known factor loading pattern. So it looks something like this usually. There are different ways of drawing these diagrams. One of the issues in general with the diagrams for these kinds of models, one, they get sort of messy, and two, you can draw the diagram many different ways, and it looks like the same. Uh, it might look like a very different model, but it's the same model. So let's talk about the A component. They're listed as uh, capital A1 and capital A2. I have their variances fixed at one, and I have the covariance between them, uh, which now because the variances are one is a correlation. Uh, so this R coefficient is a coefficient of relatedness. That's why it's uh, an R. Uh, 
so for MZ twins, we set that to one. For DZ twins, we set that to 0.5. Uh, and then the C component is C1 and C2. Um, again, all the factor variances on these are set to one uh, so that we have the correlations here. Uh, the correlation between those two uh, is one, and then there's a correlation of zero between the E's. Uh, the P1 and the P2, which perhaps I should have started with, but we'll circle back around. Uh, these are the phenotypes for the first member of a twin pair and the second member of a twin pair. Critically, these two variables are the same phenotype, but on two different people, uh, such that your data are sort of structured so that you have kind of one family per row. There are other ways of doing this. I kind of cite a couple of examples up there at the top from plugging my own work. Ooh. Uh, but P1 is, say, uh, height of twin 1, and P2 is, say, height of twin 2. Uh, it could be body mass index of twin 1 and twin 2, but the key is that it's the same variable uh, in there. So it could be like, uh, I don't know, if we think back to the dog example, it could be, say, the weight of one dog. This is P1 is, say, Jamie's weight, and P2 is, say, uh, Lily's weight. Uh, and then we decompose the variation in that into these components. That's, uh, sort of basic idea of the ACE model just as a foundation for what we're going to be talking about uh, more in the remainder of this talk. Uh, so this is sort of set up to look like a factor model. You've got A factors, you've got C factors, you've got E factors, you've got fixed, uh, you've got known factor loading patterns by estimated parameters, estimating the A's, the C's, and the E's, the little, the little uh, A's, C's, and E's. Uh, and you have known factor covariance patterns. So the A's correlate according to uh, the relatedness of the members of the twin pair, the C's correlate one, and the E's correlate zero. So that's, those are the things that we use to identify this sort of model. Uh, but there are other ways of thinking about this, uh, and that, those will be important. So if you kind of work this out into the uh, algebra, uh, the algebraic version of the same model, so the diagram I show here is you know, a diagram of a factor model. Here's equations for a factor model. Basically, for the remainder of this talk, we're all going to be living in equation land. Uh, in subsequent talks, I have diagrams that go with these as well, but in this version, uh, we're kind of doing a lot of equations. So essentially how I have this uh, set up is you've got factor loadings matrices and you've got factor covariance matrices. I should be able to annotate this. This is a factor loadings matrix for the A factors. So we'll call that L sub A. Uh, we can call this, say, phi sub A. And then this would be L sub A transpose. And kind of on and on. So we get basically a set of factors. So you've got factor loadings, factor covariances, and then the transpose of those factor loadings, and that leads to the A part of the variance going in here. Uh, the next row is just added on uh, to that, the next row of equations. So we have a similar structure for the C's and a similar structure for the E's. The main difference uh, is uh, the factor covariances. Uh, so essentially we've got this a, we've got a phi C with its uh, unit structure, ones everywhere, uh, and we've got phi E, which is diagonal. Uh, it's an identity matrix here. Uh, so the main difference here is just the structure of these factor covariances, and then the factor loading patterns are sort of the same across all of those. Uh, so this is just decomposing, uh, kind of resetting that diagram basically into matrices and equations. Uh, and that if you work out all the algebra for that, the kind of resulting uh, matrix is this guy here uh, that we uh, see a lot with these kinds of uh, twin family models. That This is sort of a, a classic structure that we find. But I said that there was other ways to do this, uh, and here is uh, an equivalent uh, representation of the same sort of model. Uh, here I've set it up uh, such that you've got RA, RC, and RE relatedness matrices. These are give you the structure of the relatedness pattern, where I've got blocks in here. Uh, 
Uh, so it's a block diagonal. So the relatedness matrices sort of in this block here, uh, in the upper left panel of each of these blocks, these are the relatedness matrices that you have for the MZ twins. Uh, and in the kind of second block of each of these, you've got the relatedness pattern for the DZ twins. Uh, now across these, the blocks are the same except for the genetics. So that here in this kind of uh, this particular design where we've got say twins, uh, MZ and DZ twins all raised uh, together, uh, where that members within a twin pair are raised together, you get very similar structures except for the uh, genetic component, which is sort of the key element of the twin and family uh, of this twin and family design, where you know everything else is sort of the same except the uh, across the MZ and DZ twin pairs except the MZ twin pairs are 100% uh, related and the DZ twin per pairs are 50% uh, related. Uh, so this is just a different way of structuring the same uh, sort of uh, model. Uh, but it's uh, structured differently uh, such that this, uh, instead of thinking of this now as kind of uh, factor loadings and we've got A factors and C factors and E factors, now we're structuring it sort of differently, thinking about relatedness patterns for A, for the additive genetics, relatedness patterns for the shared environments, and relatedness patterns for the unique environments. And then we have these kind of variances that are associated with this relatedness pattern. So the relatedness pattern is this RA, and the variance associated with that is A squared. And the variance associated with the uh, shared environmental pattern is C squared. And the uh, relatedness pattern for E is this diagonal matrix and the variance associated that with that is this E squared. So we're kind of restructuring our thinking from sorts of factor models to sorts of variance component models. Uh, now the next step in getting this uh, to multivariate models uh, is sort of, uh, well, we want to see that these things are, that they map to the same thing. So I've taken out, uh, kind of generalized this. So instead of having uh, these two blocks, one covariance block for the MZ twins and one for the DZ twins. I'll just have one covariance block for a relatedness pattern, uh, and I'll call that sigma sub R. And really uh, kind of abstracting that, the relatedness pattern for the A relatedness is just uh, this sigma, uh, this matrix of ones with an R on the off diagonal, uh, and then the other two kind of don't vary by relatedness. And if you again, kind of do the math, so to speak, and multiply everything out so that the A squared multiplies by every element in this matrix, that's sort of scalar by matrix multiplication, uh, then you get uh, all of these result matrices. And again, you get uh, the important result here, which is this guy, uh, which is the same implied covariance matrix as we had before. Uh, that's a critical feature of these models and ways of thinking about these models is that factor model sort of way of thinking about it with the A factor and the C factor and the E factor is exactly mathematically equivalent to this variance component version of thinking about the model. Uh, so that the two are exactly equivalent to one another. You can think about it one way or the other way, whichever one makes sense to you. But what makes sense for this talk is this variance component version, because then we can use this version to grow the model into uh, more complicated and fun phenomena. Uh, so the first modification we need to make to this uh, is sort of notational. Uh, so I'm adding this uh, new bit of notation in here, this uh, X with a uh, circle around it. Uh, that bit of notation is conventionally used for uh, the Kronecker product which is technically correct about what we want uh, to be doing here. Essentially, what the Kronecker product uh, is saying to do is multiply every element in one matrix by every element in the other matrix. Now, the matrix on the left hand side of each of these products is uh, two by two. The matrix on the right hand side of each of these is one by one. So the result is just two by two uh, because we multiply this scalar by every single value in here. Uh, the example we're going to see next uh, broadens this out. Uh, but this just gives you the same result as we had from the, the previous slide. So this model here and this model here give you the same thing. I'm just sort of changing some notation on you. Uh, 
Now this is uh, the kind of extended version where, okay, the previous version worked with a single phenotype, uh, but now we're going to do this with two phenotypes. So now we've got not just one A factor, you've got uh, two A factors, you've got two phenotypes uh, in here. Uh, let's say one is height and one is weight, uh, so that we have some genetic variants associated with height, some genetic variants associated with weight, and now we've got this genetic covariance associated with height and weight in the genes between them. Now the Kronecker product between these basically takes, um, takes this matrix and multiplies it by every element of the other matrix. So we've got uh, this these smaller, the relatedness pattern matrix, kind of showing you here in each of these blocks. Uh, and then you've got this matrix kind of multiplying by each of those. Uh, and you can see how this could be extended up to three or four or five uh, matri uh, five phenotypes uh, with these genetic covariances. Um, it just sort of grows this model big. And you can see that uh, the structure of this resulting model would be highly repetitive. Uh, you know, there's a lot of repeated stuff in here. Uh, the Kronecker product kind of lets you avoid kind of repeating things uh, more often than you might need to otherwise. So the next thing we're going to see is this version of this uh, ACE model with, with two phenotypes using this uh, Kronecker product. And here it is. So notationally, it's not a whole lot harder than the version that uh, we had before. So essentially we're replacing, uh, we're sort of generalizing what we have for the A, C, and E variance components. So in the single phenotype model, the variance components were single variances. They were just say that A squared was just a single variance. And now we're replacing that A squared with a A covariance matrix. So instead of being just uh, a single number, now it's a matrix of numbers. Uh, and this gives us the opportunity to describe things that we couldn't describe before. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, we want to be able to talk about what this A sub 1, 2 is. Uh, technically, it's not a correlation as the slide title sort of suggests. It's a covariance, uh, depending, but depending how we scale things, this uh, A squared, uh, we could set these uh, things to be one, and then A12 would be uh, a, a correlation matrix. We could just standardize things. So the idea of uh, genetic correlation uh, is that essentially the genes for one phenotype might sort of be shared or related to the genes for another phenotype. Uh, you can take any pair of phenotypes that you want. Uh, you know, we can talk about uh, say the color pattern on a dog, if we have some quantitative scale for measuring the kind of color pattern on a dog, uh, and let's say the height of the dog, that we think that these two might be related such that, I don't know, uh, height, uh, the height of a dog has some uh, kind of linear relationship with the color pattern on the dog that, you know, taller dogs are, you know, more pale and shorter dogs are, are darker or something. Uh, and we could say, well, maybe the genes for these things overlap. And this is a, an entirely ridiculous example because there are kind of foundational uh, genetic studies related to taming of animals like uh, breeding foxes that correlate a large number of genetic traits uh, together about like large eyes and kind of, uh, you know, kind of baby faces and things that and get associated with uh, kind of the taming of, of certain kinds of animals. Uh, that make them sort of developmentally look uh, more uh, juvenile. Uh, so it's not a ridiculous thing to think that the genes for one phenotype uh, might be related to the genes for another phenotype, that they might share something. Uh, so that's essentially what we're talking about with this uh, A12 co uh, element of this matrix, that the genes for one phenotype are sort of shared with uh, another phenotype. Now the same thing uh, can apply just as, you know, to shared environments and also to the unique environments. So the environmental factors that say uh, lead to your dog being overweight could be the same things uh, that lead to your dog having heart disease. 
Uh, there could be shared environmental factors about, you know, eating too much fatty foods or not getting enough activity that these kind of environmental factors lead to the same uh, that are sort of shared across phenotypes. Uh, or unique environmental factors, the same thing applies. Uh, there is one thing that I want to mention specifically to head off a confusion that happens a lot um, with genetic correlations, and I've sort of led you into this confusion, uh, is there's uh, often people have a question about the uh, genetic correlation. Well, what happens if this A12 coefficient is negative? They sort of get into this mindset that it, A12 is the proportion of shared genes between phenotypes. Uh, which is incorrect. Uh, it is not the proportion of shared genes between phenotypes. Uh, and then because they think it is this proportion, people seem to think that it can't be negative. Um, but it can be negative. Uh, so it's a correlation between variables. Uh, correlations can be anywhere between minus one and plus one for, uh, for any phenotypes that you want. Uh, a way to see this is, let's say, you know, height and weight. We think that height and weight uh, kind of phenotypically are correlated, but we also might think that height and weight are uh, genetically correlated uh, in the sense of, you know, the genes that make you taller might be similar or overlapping with the genes that make you uh, heavier. So we might expect those to be have this positive uh, genetic association. Uh, but if we kind of tweak our model around and instead of modeling height and weight, we just model uh, height and negative weight. We just replace weight in our data set with negative weight. Uh, so if you weigh 100 kilograms, then now you weigh minus 100 kilograms uh, in the data set. And you do the same analysis and all of a sudden that uh, A12 covariance between the genes goes from positive whatever it was to negative whatever it was. Uh, it's just a scaling uh, factor. Um, it doesn't mean anything uh, about uh, how uh, it doesn't produce some kind of uh, impossible result to have A12 be a, a negative value. Uh, now, if you square uh, A12, just like you square any, uh, let's say A12 was scaled to be a, a correlation coefficient, not a covariance. So if you square A12, uh, now it's a number between zero and one, and now it is a proportion of shared variance between uh, two uh, things. So that value has to be positive, but A12 itself can be between minus one and plus one if it's scaled to be a correlation. If it's scaled to be a covariance, it could be you know anything about anything. It could be minus 10, it could be plus 100, uh, you know, depending how your variables are scaled. It's just a covariance. Uh, so I've spent kind of a, a while talking about this genetic uh, covariance bit. Hopefully this uh, makes a little bit of sense. Free to talk more about it uh, in the kind of remaining uh, elements of the talk. So uh, you can see how you generalize the, the, the two phenotype model here uh, to three phenotypes by just, now you extend that uh, same covariance matrix out larger. And the kind of data that you put into this gets commensurately uh, larger. You've just got three phenotypes for one twin pair, three phenotypes for the other twin pair, uh, and it gets modeled. And we'll have some kind of uh, applied examples that actually fit these sorts of models uh, to data. Uh, and uh, hopefully you get the idea of, well, after three phenotypes, well, you can just keep adding phenotypes uh, all day. Uh, and the only real limit is, you know, the memory of your, your computer uh, and the data that you've collected. You can keep adding these things all, all you want. Uh, it keeps working. I think the next bit here is starting to uh, have ideas uh, about uh, modeling these equations. Yeah, so I think we're going to stop it here because this video is getting a little on the long side and we'll pick up the kind of part two of this same lecture uh, by talking about what do we do when we want to uh, model uh, these covariances. So we can essentially uh, we're using these genetic uh, structures to model our phenotypic relationships, but then we can in turn model the uh, genetic correlations and the environmental correlations as well. Uh, so we'll pick that up next time.